Hello, my name is Vagrant Cascadian, and I will be presenting Free as in Sunshine. So, this story goes back, uh, back to about five years now. I uh, had a limited amount of space uh, where I was living, and I needed an office. So, after looking around for a while, we rolled a small building into the backyard. Uh, and I talked to a friend uh, that I'd run into over the years about going with solar. Um, this person was Scott Johnson, who works on a project called SolarNet One, and uh, he deploys uh, small off-grid schools uh, in, on remote islands. Uh, he had used a technology that I had worked on in Debian for many years called LTSP. And uh, at that at that time, back in 2015, he was exploring switching all of the systems over to ARM, as I understand it. So we cross paths again because I also work on ARM and Debian. So he pointed me to a Kickstarter project uh, put on by Electrodacus, and this project was for a battery management controller for solar systems. And one of its most uh, main features was that it supported a relatively new form of battery chemistry called lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate has some really interesting advantages. In particular, it has a very long life cycle. Uh, when I mean very long life cycle, I mean as compared to lead acid batteries where you might get five or six years out of them, we're looking at more like 10, 15, 20 years of life cycle out of a lithium iron phosphate battery. So that's pretty exciting for a system. You can also use almost the full capacity of the battery without really damaging it. Uh, lead acid batteries, you really don't want to drop below 50%. So effectively, a lead acid battery is uh, roughly half the capacity it's advertised at. Whereas with a lithium iron phosphate battery, you can arguably do many, many relatively deep cycle discharges without serious damage to the battery. Uh, probably one of the most exciting things about lithium iron phosphate is they are extremely safe. Uh, unlike other lithium chemistries, they're very stable. They're not prone to uh, overheating or a chemical thermal runaway cycle, which could lead to very dangerous things. I don't know if you recall some years back, a number of phones had recalls on them because they started catching fire. And lithium iron phosphate are very unlikely to catch fire. This is perhaps one of the most exciting features of this new technology for me. Um, and they can also be safely kept indoors, unlike lead acid batteries, which off-gas certain materials, uh, certain chemicals that you really don't want to be breathing and are dangerous to living things. But uh, they come with some disadvantages. You can't have everything for free. And probably the most noticeable one is how much more expensive they seem to be. Some of these are mitigated by the long life expectancy of the battery and, uh, and the fact that you can actually use more of the full capacity without fear of damaging your batteries. But it's still a pretty significant uh, thing to consider. They're also a little bit larger than some other lithium chemistries. Um, I forget how they compare to lead acid, but uh, the energy density is a little bit lower, but for my application of a fairly stable, not particularly mobile thing, uh, it's pretty good. So that mitigates that disadvantage. Um, and there are some rare materials used in just about any battery chemistry these days. So. That, that was brought up to me, um, I think, by Joey Hess, but I had already uh, gone hog wild on this battery plan, so uh, I was going to run forward even though uh, rare material mining is, is a bit concerning. So I got on the Kickstarter, and I ordered it, and it arrived in 2016. I had my very own battery management controller. I... Uh, I had big dreams ahead. I had really big dreams ahead. I was planning um, 
I could probably fit uh, somewhere between four and five uh, large scale, uh, large 24 volt solar panels on the roof. Um, so I was figuring, why don't I go try to max this system out? It can handle, you know, one, 1 1.8 kilowatts of solar panels, so I may as well fill it out. Uh, the panels are relatively cheap, all things considered, and in order to use all those panels, you need a very large battery. So I held on to these dreams, but that basically meant that it was backburnered for many, many years. I was sitting on this idea, and I couldn't really, I, I never quite had enough funds to get all the various parts. In particular, the battery would cost around 2,000 plus US dollars. The solar panels, another 1,000, almost 2,000 dollars. Uh, I would need like a relatively expensive inverter. And what really terrified me was putting holes in the roof. Um, I live in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, where roughly nine months out of every year, it rains almost every day. So holes in the roof is something that kind of terrified me. And so all of these, you know, economic and just um, not wanting water falling on my head in my office uh, factors led me to backburner this project. But in late 2019, just last year, I had an idea. Why don't I build a much smaller system? Use smaller 12 volt panels rather than 24 volt panels. They can, they can, they're physically smaller. Uh, and so that gave me more options of how to mount them. A uh, smaller 12 volt battery that really took uh, a huge uh, reduction on the cost of the system and made it a lot more feasible for me. And of course, a smaller inverter as well. So, and this plan involved no holes in the roof. Uh, I was hoping to just bolt them to the side and just get something, anything going, even though bolting the panels to the side of the tiny house would, uh, would result in suboptimal performance. But I had really suboptimal performance with actually zero watt hours coming in, so I decided to move forward with this plan, and uh, I started going crazy online and ordering parts. They started arriving. And I started hemming and hawing about, really, I should go with a 24-volt battery. Uh, notably because, A, it does mean I basically have twice as much storage capacity. It's a, uh, The battery is twice as expensive, but I was going with a small battery to begin with, and I did some numbers. It didn't seem like my little 12-volt battery was really going to do. So... I ordered more battery cells, and then I needed 24 volt to 12 volt parts, so I ordered those, and they arrived, and they sat there because I still had some work to do ahead of me. But the first thing I really ended up doing on this project, uh, where I, I actually did something practical, was I used the old 12 volt system and I hooked it up to a DC to DC ATX power supply, and that gave me some regulated 5 volt and 12 volt output. And I hooked it into the existing 12 volt system, which had a very old battery, but I effectively started operating on a UPS for parts of my system, notably the networking. Uh, some of my laptops could run off of this, uh, some of the ARM laptops, which can run off of 5 volt. Uh, and that was the first uh, practical thing I did on my solar project. It involved no actual solar power. But, uh, so what was the real blocker on actually getting all the solar set up? I had all the parts, I had panels, and uh, it really came down to I needed to solder some connectors onto the battery. And so some uh, local friends of mine, Keith Packard and Bart Massey, came over and lended me their skills. And Bart ran off and got a butane torch because the connectors we had were 
pretty impressive and just using a typical soldering iron wouldn't, wouldn't really hold up to the task. Uh, and they helped me get the first part set up. So once I had all those connected, I could then add all the various parts. So uh, in the picture you see there, the, uh, the red dots are all the positive terminals on the battery. And the, there are black dots on there as well, which maybe are a little bit hard to see. But each of those is one cell. So uh, my original 12 volt batteries only had four of those. And I just ordered four more to upgrade to 24 volt. And then we've got a, a circuit breaker. And of course, the battery management itself in the lower left corner there. Uh, so those were all relatively easy to hook up. And then I had to run off for a conference, the last conference I've physically been to in quite some time. And still, I still had, uh, I still was like blocked, like how am I going to mount these panels? Like where am I going to put the, like it can't, I mean, yes, I can just bolt them to the side, but exactly how you poke holes in a nice structure is a bit concerning. So I still had a blocker. But uh, Dlib pointed out that I could use the old chicken coop we had, and I just bolted two of the panels onto that. That worked out quite nicely. So I, uh, I got that up and running, and before too long, I had collected 100 watt hours of power. So I was pretty excited about that, and I got the battery up to 59%. And uh, this was maybe... I'm forgetting if it was, I think it was mid-April I started collecting power. We got it up to 100%, and before too long, I'm like, okay, I'm going to connect the other ba uh, the other solar panels. And so I had an old, an old uh, picket fence from a neighbor that they had torn down, and I just bolted some panels to that, stuck them on the ground, and while the ground-level solar gain wasn't much, it was a lot more than sitting in cardboard boxes in my house in my office. So I got I freed up some space in my office and started generating some serious power. So how does Debian play into all this? Well other than the Scott uh, Johnson from SolarNet One having used Debian on all these remote islands being what led me to this whole project, I, uh, I've started set up a little uh, ARM board running Debian that downloads and processes the data from my solar panels. And uh, this is used to produce a rainbow squiggly line graph. Um, so here you can see uh, this is a pretty nice sunny day for me. I was getting about 250 watts at the peak. And uh, you can see some dips and sways there. I'll get to some more of this later. But so how exactly did I get the data out of there? Well. Uh, there's a Wi-Fi connection that that little board connects to. So this little board connects to Wi-Fi on the battery management controller. And then it downloads some data that looks a bit like this. So, uh, I don't know, it, to the human eye, that doesn't look very readable as far as data goes. So uh, there was a JavaScript page that the um, Electrodecus produce that you could use to produce probably a prettier graph than my graph, but uh, I, I decided to rewrite this in a little bit of Python. Uh, this, this function is more or less a rough, a pretty much just directly Pythonized version of the JavaScript version that deciphers this. And so you have the data is in various columns and uh, you use this, it, I think it uses Unicode code points basically to derive numbers out of, uh, it's like a base 91 uh, encryption scheme. So I managed to figure out how to use that data and one of the really annoying things, if you look in that data, there are, there are like four backslashes and it took me forever to figure out why my data was always going crazy, and that's because they're escaped backslashes, and I really need to process them as single backslashes. Uh, so that took me a while to figure out, but it was very exciting once I did. Um, so 
I have like multiple competing solar projects going on here. Uh, when I set up that second array of panels, I also planted a bunch of sunchokes. Uh, and they grew very tall in just a few months. I think I installed these sunchokes before I actually installed the second array of panels. And they're, they're, they're providing a wonderful shade, but uh, later in the day they end up shading the panels, so I've made sure to like kind of push them off to the side there. And uh, so this is this is where I really want to focus on how in projects you can have different types of solar. Uh, solar fo solar photovoltaics are only one kind of solar. I think uh, some simple technologies like the efficiency of plants. These these plants produce food and they provide shade, which dramatically k keep the cooling on the house down. So uh, that that basically was just one point I wanted to point out. I have some other ideas. Uh, here's just sort of a a bunch of the different other components. I eventually upgraded the AC inverter on the right there. I, I ended up getting a larger inverter in the end anyway, but it's only 600 watts, uh, but it's 24 volt. And the really important thing on the inverter I ended up first getting was that this has its own ground because the other one had AC power with an open ground, which was ugly. In the middle there is one of my favorite little uh, adapters there. It's uh, You have a little potentiometer, and so you input whatever voltage, and then you can downscale it to whatever voltage you need. So the laptop that was used to create this performance while I was writing this performance, that's a picture of that powering the laptop itself. And on the, on the very left there is a squid of all of my various cable mismanagement issues. So uh, that's a fuse box so that if anything does go awry, uh, hopefully it'll catch it before anything goes horribly wrong. But uh, if you notice in that graph there, uh, there are a number of spots where the color gets really dense. And that's basically because the solar is turning on again and off again uh, periodically. It'll reach maximum, it'll reach the maximum charge, and then it'll turn off the solar panels because it doesn't have anything to do. So I got a 24 volt uh, kettle to boil some water because that can consume quite a bit of power and most of those black peaks you see there are when it drains the when it's running the electric kettle but this is only 800 milliliters at a time which is a very manual process so I was scheming of ideas how to hook up my water heater uh, which has dual electric and propane and it, prov it has about 10 gallons uh, otherwise known as slightly under 38 liters. And I want a microcontroller to monitor how much solar power is available and dynamically adjust the power output. So when I get uh, those peaks, I can just basically provide exactly the amount of excess power I want instead of manually unplugging and replugging it and maybe it's drawing too much power or too little power. So, essentially, though, I've destroyed a, a one bitsy microcontroller and a Pocket Beagle ARM board in the process of trying to hook up this little regulator that you see pictured. Uh, supposedly, I can put a P PWM signal on that and output, uh, output uh, an adjustable voltage. I have numerous other plans, uh, the most important being as winter is approaching, <laughs> although we're in the dead of summer right now, but I want to get the panels on the roof because uh, we get about nine months of cloudy days here and th the current location of where the panels are is just really suboptimal. Uh, I also want to get a low temperature shutoff uh, with the lithium iron phosphate batteries. If it gets much below freezing, or well, you want to get nowhere near freezing, so you want to make sure that it has a safety valve on making sure you're not charging the batteries in a way that'll damage them. 
I want to get the serial data logging. I haven't really been loving the Wi-Fi logging. And I want to, this, this is what's pictured here, is I want to use microcontrollers to turn things off and on again. And using MicroPython or CircuitPython to do that. And of course, a thermal draft for a solar system. Huge thanks to Scott Johnson, Dacian Tadea, Keith Packard and Bart Massey, and of course, Dlib, uh, for all your help in all of this. Thanks very much.